Here he is, the man with the plan, your rules commentator, Aaron Bland. Hello again, this is Aaron Bland with your rules, fantasy sports your way. In the quarter century I've been playing, the unwritten rule has never changed. Get running backs early because they dry up quickly and without them you are sunk. Never has this been more important as more and more NFL teams turn to a committee approach and the bell cow runner gets closer to extinction. After the first nine or ten runners are off the board, there's a noticeable drop-off. Don't miss out on getting one of those guys. There is a consensus top three this season, but in what order? And who in the world do you take after those three are off the board? Let's get going and start with number ten. Leonard Fournette. Now, I debated four or five different runners here and finally decided on the hotshot rookie. With Tom Coughlin back in the mix and Blake Bortles regressing, it's evident that the Jags are intent on using a more ball control approach going forward. Fournette is a ridiculous talent, a 240 pound monster that runs a 4'5", 140 and makes a habit out of flattening defenders in his path. Now Jacksonville did not select him fourth overall in the draft to set him on the bench behind mediocre running backs Curtis Ivory and TJ Yeldon. He's going to get a lot of carries. As a result, I think he's got a legitimate shot at a dozen or more touchdowns. The concerns about Fournette are legit. He had a number of leg injuries at LSU and will likely be pulled out on passing downs. All right, moving on to number nine, DeMarco Murray. After having several injury-prone seasons, the talented Murray piled up 293 carries and 53 catches last year and was every bit the bell cow the Titans were looking for when they signed him. The Titans made a concerted effort in free agency and the draft to upgrade the talent on the offensive side of the ball and Marcus Mariota should take another step forward this season, which should open up more opportunities in the run game. Still, it's easy to be concerned about Murray. He's entering his age 29 season and faded badly in the last six weeks of last year. Talented youngster Derrick Henry is also breathing down his neck and is going to continue to cut into his workload. Nevertheless, the Titans didn't give Murray a $25 million contract to sit him on the bench. Coach Mike Malarkey recently reiterated that he remains the workhorse. He may have a good season or two left in him yet, but draft him at your own risk. All right, number eight, Jordan Howard. A lot of people have Howard ranked higher, many as high as fourth. After an extremely impressive rookie season in which the fifth rounder came out of nowhere to rack up over 1,600 yards from scrimmage, you can understand why. He was also very consistent with seven 100-yard games and an astounding 5.2 yards per carry. Now, unlike last year, the Bears head into the season with Howard penciled in as the primary back. He also benefits from the sixth easiest schedule against the run this season. However, I feel that Howard may suffer from the Todd Gurley effect, which is defined as a talented runner that's going to face eight-man fronts all season. The Bears are trotting untested Mike Glennon out there this year and have perhaps the largest group of no-name receivers in the entire league. It's difficult to see how the rebuilding Bears are going to move the ball and will probably even throw rookie Mitch Trubisky to the Wolves out there at some point. It may be a good idea to let someone else overreach for Howard high in your draft. All right, moving on to number seven, Jay Ajayi. Now, after being benched to start the season last year and playing sparingly for the first month, Ajayi exploded for back-to-back 200-yard -back rushing games in Week 6 and 7 and 111 yards the following game against a tough Jets defense. The lucky fantasy owners that had plucked him off the waiver wire or stashed him after taking him late in the draft were certain they had found that hidden jewel that would lead them to the promised land. However, Ajayi proceeded to average a mere 60 yards rushing the next six games with one meager touchdown. In week 16, after his irritated fantasy owners had moved him back to the bench, or simply missed the playoffs, he exploded for his third 200-yard game of the season against the Bills. With such a strange season, what in the world can be expected this year? It's a tough call. Ajayi got half of his entire season rushing yards in those three games. This season, he doesn't have to worry about entering the season on the bench. And offensive coordinator Clyde Christensen recently lauded his improved receiving skills, so expect him to catch a lot more than 27 passes this season. He should be safe for a lot of carries, but the Dolphins' dink and dunk offenses have frustrated fantasy owners for years, and I could easily see that frustration continuing. 
However, it takes a tremendous amount of talent to have three 200-yard rushing games in a single season, and at some point, you can't just pass that talent up. All right, moving on to number six, Devontae Freeman. And despite being in a bit of a timeshare situation with Tevin Coleman, Freeman still rumbled for more than 1,500 yards for scrimmage and 13 touchdowns last year. The fact is there's so many yards and touchdowns to go around in the wide-open Falcons offense. The talented players like Freeman can rack up pinball machine numbers even while sharing the ball. He's an ec excellent short yardage runner. He scored 11 touchdowns on the ground the last two seasons and even had 54 catches last year. The running backs in the Falcons offense never have to worry about eight-man fronts, and the passing game creates endless scoring opportunities. Now, Freeman's in the final year of his rookie contract, but a long-term deal is expected to be signed before training camp. If it isn't, make note of it, because Freeman could be especially motivated in a contract year. All right, number five, LaShawn McCoy. After an injury-riddled 2015 season, McCoy bounced back in a big way last year with over 1,600 yards from scrimmage and 14 touchdowns. He has the honor of having the entire Bills offense built around him and still has great wheels in the open field. Now, despite being keyed on by defenses, he managed an obscene 5.4 yards per carry and added 50 catches. In fact, McCoy was the league leader by a wide margin in yards per carry against eight-man fronts. The Bills let talented backup Mike Gillisley leave for New England, so McCoy becomes even more important to their success this year. However, the big question is, can he hold up? McCoy is 28, has a history of injuries, and with noodle-armed Tyrod Taylor at quarterback, is going to continue to see stacked boxes. Still, there's only so far you can let him fall. He's one of the few three-down backs left in the NFL. All right, number four, Melvin Gordon. Now, despite having to play behind the worst offensive line in football last year and missing three games, Gordon still managed more than 1,400 yards from scrimmage and 12 touchdowns. He remains one of the NFL League leaders in yards after contact and is a short yardage monster. With the Chargers upgrading their willful offensive line through free agency in the draft and adding another huge weapon in wide receiver Mike Williams, I could easily see Gordon scoring 15 or more touchdowns. Now, the new Chargers coach, Anthony Lynn, has stated he's determined to take Gordon to another level. The cherry on the Sunday is that the Chargers have the NFL's easiest schedule against the run this season. So, do not hesitate to grab Gordon after the big three running backs are off the board. And speaking of those big three, let's start with them. Number three, Le'Veon Bell. Now, when Bell is healthy, he may be the best player in the entire league. He has a very unique running style in which he hesitates at the line of scrimmage and then darts forward through seemingly tiny gaps, and he's the only runner in the NFL with the talent to get away with it. The Steelers also have the weapons to keep defenses from stacking the line, and even if they tried it, Bell would simply line up a receiver and burn them through the air. Despite only playing in 12 games last season, he still managed an astounding 1,884 yards from scrimmage and nine touchdowns. However, it's the perpetual problem of missing games that drops Bell to third on this list. Over the past several seasons, Bell has missed games with two NFL suspensions and foot, groin, and knee injuries. In fact, Bell just had groin surgery in March, but is expected to be fully recovered for training camp. The fact is he's too talented to pass on for long and should be a top three selection in every fantasy draft. When he's healthy, he's good enough to single-handedly win games for you. All right, moving on to number two. Ezekiel Elliott. Elliott is in such a great situation that not only did I place him ahead of Le'Veon Bell, I even considered him at first overall. He managed to scamper for over 1,600 yards and 15 touchdowns despite being a defensive focal point with a rookie quarterback behind center. He is a workhorse that will probably lead the NFL in carries behind the best offensive line in the NFL. Now, Dak Prescott is bound to be better this year, which is only going to help his situation. And Des Bryant is always roaming the field, drawing defenses away. It's almost as if Emmitt Smith has returned to Dallas. Now, while not the receiver that David Johnson or Le'Veon Bell are, Elliott posted a respectable 32 catches for 363 yards last season. And in fact, his yards per reception were actually higher than both of those other guys. I, I think you can expect more yards through the air this year. Now, simply put, he's one of the safest picks in the entire draft. And that moves us to number one, no surprise, David Johnson. Now, I kept trying to come up with ways, you know, reasons why Johnson shouldn't be the first pick in fantasy drafts, and I just couldn't find any. 
He avoided a major knee injury in Week 17 last year and is fully recovered and ready to go. Now, as a matter of fact, both Coach Bruce Arians and Johnson himself are boasting about wanting 30 touches a game this season. Now, while that probably won't happen, it doesn't need to for him to still carry his owners to fantasy championships. Johnson was not was nothing short of spectacular last year, racking up over 1,200 yards and 16 touchdowns on the ground, and an additional 80 catches for nearly 900 yards and four touchdowns in the air on an unbelievable 120 targets. The entire offense is built around him, and the Cardinals still have enough talent on offense to keep defenses from completely, from completely focusing on him. He's one of the few backs in the league that never come off the field, He's an excellent short yardage runner and a spectacular receiver. In fact, he's got an outstanding chance at becoming a third running back in history to post a 1,000-yard rushing and receiving season. Do not hesitate to pull the trigger on him with the first overall pick in your draft. Now, if you'd like to get a little more in-depth breakdown, plus my rankings of many of the other backs, just head over to yourrules.com and check out my articles. I'd also like to remind everyone to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. And by doing so, you won't miss out on any of the news, tips, and advice from all the Orals contributors. You can also email me anytime at Aaron at YourRules.com with any questions, comments, or advice. Now, Your Rules will also be the exclusive fantasy provider at Tony Rummel's National Fantasy Football Conference in Dallas in July. Head over to GoNFFC.com for more details. Now, with its patented in-game substitution feature, your rules is poised to take the fantasy football world by storm, and it all starts at the NFFC on July 14th. I hope to see you there. Bye for now.